Give us any chance, we'll take it. Read us any rule, we'll break it. We're gonna make our dreams come true. Hello, I'm Lisa Fernandes, co-host of Night After Night, a podcast about eight seasons in a row. I'm here to talk a little bit about my five favorite episodes from this season of Laverne and Shirley. The second season really is where the show finds its footing and becomes its own thing. A beautiful combination of slapstick comedy with flashes of sentiment and character growth. It developed a reputation in its time as a broadly comic, critic-irritating show that appealed strongly to kids. That everyone from working women to old folks were watching the show at its height bringing it close to the top of the Nielsen charts, where it would reign for its next two seasons. I could probably name ten episodes of import for the series from this season, and have a list that's so vital to the show's overall structure. But these five episodes are ones that I always return to without fail, to inspire me, lift my spirits, or make me laugh. There are no lengthy honorable mentions this time, mostly because the show is so darn good this season you can start anywhere and find something terrific to watch. If you want a few more recommendations, Two of Our Weirdos Are Missing, Guilty Against Will Proven Not Innocent, and Haunted House are all my runners up list this season. My hair is never gonna dry! Well, why don't you stick your head in the oven? <laughs> well, thank you very much. Fall episodes, those rare sitcom adventures that place the show's main characters in a single location for the entire duration of its running time. Stepping Out manages to be frantic, memorable, and funny in dozens of different ways, while leaving most of the action focused on Laverne and Shirley, their apartment, and their singular, simple goal, getting out of the house and off on a double date, in spite of the chaos that's currently surrounding them. Murphy's Law, and judiciously seasoning the pot, the dabs of Edna, Lenny, Squiggy, and Carmine prevent their orally preparation, and brings the parade of Looky Loose through the living room, which doesn't help either. The show handles this with some great physical humor, how Penny Marshall could cling to the side of a refrigerator like that, I'll never know. And some rapid fire character humor. What do you got? I got uh, some playing cards, I got a notebook and pencil, I got a folding comb, I got a nail file, I got emergency phone dime stamps and a handkerchief. That's it. Why don't you just pack a trunk? Oh, come on, LeBron. This episode contains a memorable image of Lenny and Squeaky dressed up as firemen that eventually becomes part of the show's opening credits. It's not the last time they'll play at that profession, a game that will eventually reap sad results for both of them. What do you want? Is Shirley naked too? No. She's in the oven. <laughs> oh my gosh, she's cooking herself to death. Is there are antics that lead to a soak lover and Shirley whose sissy fee inclined to leisure time paradise results in laughter unto tears. A state that many folks who have watched Stepping Out will find themselves in. that there are five indelible images which exist in the minds of people who casually consumed Laverne and Shirley when it was at its height of popularity. The first is Laverne trying to strike her way through a drugged up haze in Bowling for Raspberries. The second is the girl's titanic struggle with the bed sheet in Angels of Mercy. The third is the battle with the Murphy bed in Dinner for Four. And the fourth is the piercing call of Betty, pick up your hash blacks, during the diner. I am willing to wager that some portion of the effortlessly choreographed party scene that provides a climax to this episode has been indelibly printed on the subconscious of America's psyche. Maybe it's Laverne's face first flop into a pile of pate. Maybe it's Shirley's desperate effort to suck a shrimp from between Laverne's sleep clenched teeth. Or Laverne's half gainer flop onto the floor. Whichever moment, it's likely that this episode is part of your subconscious, and for a very good reason. It's got a titanic amount of funny physical comedy, a wonderful nod to class consciousness, and some of the season's best supporting work, including some funny stuff from Harry Shearer in a ball cap. Oh, you've been here before, huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. You might call me a regular. <laughs> well, every man to himself, huh? Wait, wait. <laughs> Haven't we all forgotten something? All of this chaos is sparked off by the girl's desire to attend a cocktail party in Edna's place. They can't afford the entry fee, so they coax, in Shirley's case, Nuzzle, and Laverne's case, Knack, with the boys, to get a spot at their private little gold mine. Yeah, we're the paid subjects for the scientific experiments. Oh, yes. <laughs> the guinea pigs. <laughs> <laughs> a place where paid medical experimentation is undertaken. Laverne chooses to starve herself of sleep, and Shirley chooses to just plain starve. A scheduling accident results in them showing up at the party desperately hungry and in desperate need of sleep, conversely. 
and thus sparked some incredibly memorable comedy, thanks to the sterling direction of James Burroughs. This was a favorite episode of both Penny and Cindy, and it continues to stand the test of time for a very good reason. Come on, be blonde, tell me! Uh, if you really like this girl, then why don't you go to a nice men's shop and rent yourself some evening wear, huh? Evening, evening wear? What do you mean, pajamas? <laughs> what? You know. Really? Like an usher? Hi Neighbor Book 2 takes such a fascinating look at how the like repulsion rapport between our two main duos operates that it works as a character study and as a never ending cavalcade of comedy. As much as I love Hi Neighbor because the boys have slowly begun to round out as characters and become more sympathetic as they got more screen time, this is a somewhat superior episode to it. Yet due to the massive brainness of this season, it only notches a third place finish on my list. But honestly, this and the next entry could easily swap slots for me. They're equally incredible and important in their own ways. The first segment of the episode is about two things. The somewhat fonder than it was in season one feelings the girls have for the boys, and the brother-like willingness the boys have to put each other first. Of course, there's a lot of repulsion layered in with those feelings. Squiggy tells Lenny he's the best he could do on such short notice for this double date he's about to embark on, and the girls make a vow to each other that they'll never tell another living soul that they actually went out on a date with Lenny and Squiggy. Yeah, the center of it all is the unbreakable four-way bond between them. By the time they're all home and in the safety of the girls' apartment, and as embarrassed as the girls initially were to be seen with the boys in public, they have surrendered to the experience and ended up having a heck of a time. And then they end up leaving the guys with one heck of a kiss. <laughs> if High Neighbor was about the guys' relationship with the girls as individuals, this is about their group dynamic and what a perfectly matched foursome they make. When Squeaky's date dumps him to shampoo Lenny's blind date, and vice versa, Laverne's dander rises at the obvious lie, and when she sticks up for the boys on the phone to Miss Barbara Hummel, the boys immediately invite Laverne Shirley to come to the fancy La Fondue instead as a reward for the loyalty. What results is a culture clash. These are four working class folks who have never seen the inside of any restaurant fancier than the pizza bowl, and they are suddenly presented with appointment seating and menus in French, so it's no wonder that Laverne accidentally ends up ordering sauce cow brains. <laughs> I'll, I'll trade you a brain for a chop. Now what am I gonna do with a brain? The details laced through the episode are what work here. Everything from Lenny's pocket tools to Squiggy deciding the shallow Miss Hummel looks like Sandra D. And a total highlight is provided by the fabulous Gino Conforti, whose sarcastic response to the fumblings of our favorite gang provides their social counterpoint for the evening. It was alive, Mademoiselle, 30 minutes ago. Yeah. You mean you killed this lobster for me? Just for you, Mademoiselle. <laughs> Somewhere between animal lover Shirley dumbing the restaurant's tank of lobsters down the sewer and Squiggy's dispatching of Barbara with pride, grace, and dignity, a season one acquaintanceship has grown into a little found family, which pushes High Neighbor Book 2 over the top for me. And yes, it's worth sending through eight other episodes to see it. Trust me. What do you think? Kiss better than the vacuum. <laughs> I want a honeymoon. I want a honeymoon. Where did I win a honeymoon? I, I want Sometimes the best thing about Laverne and Shirley is that it, like a certain pineapple loving detective, declines to resign to maturity. It celebrates fun and juvenile behavior frequently, which makes it a great show to watch with kids. Well, mostly. As in most children's media and in most of their episodes, there is a voice of reason, whether it be Mother Hen Shirley or realist Laverne, or even an outside source like Edna or Frank. This time there's no stopping them. No one hanging over their shoulders whispering that it's a bad idea to fleece a fancy hotel out of a weekend stay in their musical bed-bearing, heart-shaped, toilet-touting, Mr. Hotel Honeymoon Suite, which Shirley has illicitly won via a contest by lying that she is soon to be newlywed. Well, Shirley, did you pick a dress? Yeah, which one are you gonna wear? I'm wearing white. I earned it! Everyone from Edna, who loans them one of her five wedding dresses, to Carmine, who poses as Shirley's groom, to Lenny and Squiggy, who know about the trip, they to go along on the trip, and eventually find themselves fraternizing with the circus folks who show up to party in the girls' enormous suite. Everyone wants these girls to have a good time, and they risk their reputations on making the girls' dreams come true. 
Even Big Rosie, who's at the hotel for a proctologist convention without her husband Ogden and seems to be flirting with everything in sight wearing pants, lets loose, has fun, and ultimately saves the girl's keisters with a little bit of hush money. There is not a single sane Debbie Downer in the mix, and that's what makes Honeymoon Hotel great. The entire process of getting them there and back is utterly flawless. The storyline, as it really does in most of the show's episodes, allows the girls to win without complications. They dream big and don't fall on their faces, even when they're being literally tossed around by burly acrobats during the episode's finale. This sense of uniform fun and every dog having its day carries throughout the episode, with Lenny having a non-date with Laverne in a very agitated and recently dumped squiggy leading to an iconic popcorn buttering scene, to Laverne stealing a bunch of heart-shaped stuff from the sweets bathroom. No false steps are taken in this episode, and its high-flying humor and easily rootable premise makes you want the girls to succeed. This is one wild, messy party, and it's so much fun to watch. What can I say but bimbos? Cheryl! Yes? Cheryl! Yes. Shirley Feeney, let me ask you something. How could you do something like this? Do what? Oh, come on, don't deny it. Rosie Greenbaum's been calling up the whole world. Everybody in this neighborhood knows you're in trouble. Carmine, this is not what you think it is. Well, if it's not what I think it is, why are you going to see a Dr. Fishburne? Isn't he one of those doctors that delivers babies? Huh? 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 Imagine this 1959. You're a working class, unmarried girl who spent a recent Friday night out with your friends, tipping back some beers and partying. You kind of remember, through the drunken haze, a handsome stranger and an erotic dream involving a honeymoon. A few months later, you wake up sick for a string of mornings. What would you do? Slip out of town and quietly give the baby away, then come home as if nothing had happened. Risk your wallet, reputation, and health in a back alley abortion. Find a friend willing to make things legal and avoid the scrutiny of leering eyes and peering neighbors. Or have the kid, keep it, and create a life, a new lie, in a place where no one else knows you. Then again, you don't even really know if you're pregnant, do you? You had that dream, right? Maybe you're still a virgin. And how do you even make contact with a gynecologist when your knowledge about the facts of life begins and ends with a heavy petting session delivered by handsome hoods, facts whispered by a pervy high school friend in study hall, and a couple of dirty books or movies you peered at? In different forms, in different ways, elements of this dilemma were faced down by many women who watched Laverne and Shirley and had lived through the years before 1973's Roe v. Wade Supreme Court verdict became law of the land. An estimated 1.5 million single pregnant persons gave up their children, either willingly or by coercion, to the American foster care system in the two decades before the law went into effect. An untold number of them died from botched abortions or endured their side effects in silence. Others entered into marriages that imploded as dissatisfaction arrived in the mid to late 60s. Deborah Lechen, who received screen credit for co-writing this episode with David W. Duclon, likely remembered all these things when she created the scenario that comprises Look Before You Leap. What happened? Oh, okay. okay. I won now the contest. Won the contest. Yeah, I won. Okay. Uh, uh, I won! You I won, won the contest! I won! Yes, okay. and they wanted uh -huh. to make me an honorary uh, guy. Yeah. So, they gave me the shorts! Oh! Naturally, it's lighthearted about the subject. This is still Laverne. Surely, after all, and Laverne's pregnancy scare is just that. A scare. But it pulls the heartstrings of his viewers with incredible accuracy, nonetheless. Being a woman in the Laverne and Shirley writer's room was, according to an account from Paula A. Roth, a difficult thing during the show's first couple of seasons. Until season three, Letchen and Roth were the only women on contract as writers. And according to Roth, they were treated so poorly by their male colleagues that they bought themselves t-shirts that read Girl Writer, so they wouldn't be asked to fetch coffee or lunch for their male colleagues. By the time season three rolled around, other women would be hired, including Judy Pioli. But for the first couple of seasons... Laverne Shirley was a sitcom that was chiefly written by men. To have so few women writing a sitcom, chiefly featuring women, feels almost ludicrous. And it helps a person understand why Penny and Cindy fought so hard for different and better writing. According to accounts from Cindy, even diverting the dialogue they didn't like by inserting more physical business into the scene. That this incredibly intimate subject is encased in a story that's a tribute to a specific sort of love, the kind of love that's unconditional in the face of societal disapproval says it all. It's a beautiful story that doesn't require much physical business, instead doing the kind of quiet character humor that would decorate a good handful of the show's best episodes. There are three set pieces that anchor Look Before You Leap beautifully, each of them building to an acme and release in the final scene. 
The first kiss Betty Garrett and Sydney Williams to allow Edna's relationship with the girls to grow. Six episodes into her first season on the show, Edna Babish has become a sassier and more ultra personality than the barely developed Mrs. Havenworst, the girl's season one landlady. She's a mother several times over and a divorcee, and until this episode we don't get to see her nurturing side. Until, that is, Shirley turns to Edna for help in talking out their battle plan for determining Laverne's possible pregnancy. Allowing Edna to apply her experience to this subject, Garrett's warm wisdom is touching, making the audience immediately warm to Edna. This plants some beautiful seeds that will be reaped later in the show, and Betty Garrett digs her teeth into the first real meat the show's given her to play with a plum. Shirley, meanwhile, has sunk into mother hen mode, but she has even less experience than Laverne. And Cindy Williams plays the divide between the character's inexperience and Shirley's earnest love for Laverne and her determination to apply her nursing skills to a situation careening out of control brilliantly. At the opposite end of the scene lies Frank's conversation with Laverne, which allows Phil Foster to do a different kind of acting than we're used to seeing from him at this point in the show's trajectory. Still covered in flowers, spattered in sauce, alternately ranting threats against the man who may have touched his daughter and Laverne herself for being so heedless, we suddenly realize Frank would do almost anything for his muffin. Considering how fraught Frank and Laverne's relationship can be, and how often the show's canon he berates Laverne for not finding an Italian husband and popping out some kids, to the point of even arranging marriage for her in the next season. Moments like these were desperately needed. Penny Marshall compliments everything Foster throws out, alternating expressions of authentic feeling shame and love, the sadness in her eyes palpably real. If you don't get a lemon in your throat when Frank tells Laverne, I'm you, you're me, then you just might be made out of stone. Well, me and Squiggy were talking, you see, and yeah. we know all about your plight. And, um, well, we decided your kid ought to have a last name. Huh? Yeah, uh, on account of if he don't, the poor little guy's never gonna get any mail. But the centerpiece of the episode is a long scene between Lenny and Laverne that is remarkable for the way it changes both the relationship between the characters and the title changes it makes to how the audience perceives them. When the boys first hear that Laverne's possibly pregnant, they're scandalized, and then they snicker. Well, once the news sets in, they return to the girl's apartment, Lenny with his hair combed back and wearing a tie, Squiggy saying that whatever happens next is up to Lenny to the best of his manly abilities. Squiggy drags Shirley out of the apartment, and what proceeds to happen becomes the episode's core scene, as Lenny offers to marry Laverne and give her unborn child a name, even saying he'll support the hypothetical family by trying for a promotion at the brewery. Before this episode, Laverne and Lenny were two long-term acquaintances who barely referred to each other as friends, and Laverne was ashamed to admit that they even knew one another. It slightly implied that Lenny had a one-sided crush on Laverne, but nothing akin to the focus and intensity he will direct at her later on in the series. In that first season, his kiss, for all intents and purposes, made her sick, regardless of her feeling bad for him and sewing an L on his jacket. But their disgust begins to permutate, shapeshift, and change in this episode. They are well on their way to forging an actual friendship out of the material of their shared experiences and childhoods. And the incident begins to unlock her heart toward him a little bit. Even more importantly, Look for Elite begins the transformation of Lenny Kosnowski into a different sort of character. Less the guy threatening to throw a pizza oven in the middle of the street while on a drunken rampage during a bachelor party, and more the sort of guy who spends all night awake writing love songs. In season one, he's a vaguer character, a shade more threatening. Before the show's run is through, though, Lenny becomes the kind of guy who's naive enough to believe in Santa Claus, a man sensitive enough to date Edna's developmentally delayed daughter without crudeness, and the kind of guy who, according to Squiggy, stops to chat with old people. The kind of man who, in Laverne's words, is terrific. It's a long, long way from a character that was conceived as an extremely crude delinquent who would eventually yell, Hey, Fuzzy! at female audience members during credibility gap shows. McKeon projects an incredibly sincere vulnerability here, which will come to define Lenny as the years go on, and the character grows and grows right before our eyes. This is accomplished with dialogue that's phenomenal, which I understand was a team effort in the writer's room. Lenny replying simply to Laverne's suggestion that he lost the coin toss to decide the proposing party between himself and Squiggy with a simple, No, I won. The revelation that Kosnowski means help, there's a hog in my kitchen, and Lenny's vow to pregnantly never hit her or nothing. All comprise a proposal scene that's instantly memorable and heartwarming. Fans still remember and maintain an emotional connection to this scene to this day. And between the writing, the able direction of sitcom god James Burroughs, and the performances, something incredibly special happens. The acting here is universally phenomenal. From the rigid way Marshall holds her body, to the expression of bemused empathy on her face that finally gives way to tenderness. 
her wide eyes, the way she holds her mouth, and the sandy, self-deprecating cadence of her voice all form the picture of this tough girl who can't believe this guy is proposing to her. All come together to form the portrait of a tough girl who knows she won't marry this guy, but suddenly sees him as someone different, new. McKean, meanwhile, stands out in this first bit of dramedy the show throws his way, and he digs his teeth into the moment with relish. It's immediately recognizable that not only does he have the chops to do serial comic romance, the show has a phenomenal talent beating away at its heart. Whenever people express surprise about Michael's Emmy-nominated icy cold performance as Chuck McGill in Better Call Saul, I get incredulous. I've seen the guy play everything from a self-absorbed rock god to a stressed out ad exec being stalked by Gary Busey, to a strung out surfer, to a serial killing classical musician. He could always do this, and it was always in him, even a season and a quarter into his first SAG job. As the scene goes, it's the little details, the way he watches her face, hopeful and yet filled with anxiety. The small nervous gestures he makes with his hands and the way he finally slumps forehead first onto Marshall's knee at the foot of his long proposal speech. In a combination of shyness, fear of rejection, and exhaustion. All of this together touches the viewers' hearts. All layers of artifice just fall away, and you believe you're watching a boy barely in his 20s offering his life up to a girl he's probably liked since he was 6 years old, surprising her, amusing her, and forcing her to see their friendship in a different way. Between the two of them, in this scene, an acting partnership is formed and it will provide the show with some of its best moments. It is all, in a phrase, damn good acting. As you can tell, I don't really have anything to complain about when it comes to this episode. Maybe I would have toned down Carmine's accusations against Shirley because it's kind of hard to believe he'd listen to Rosie Greenbaum of all people instead of his erstwhile girlfriend. And in the DVD edit, Eddie Mecca is already getting shafted enough by the complete removal of his closing song, Once in Love with Amy, a Frank Sinatra hit. In fact, the music rights removal mutilates the audience's ecstatic applause when Laverne tells Frank she's not pregnant. That is completely audible on the logo edit and various other syndication edits. On the DVD, it just ruins the atmosphere of that final scene, which is still adorable and sweet, but could have had a harder punch. But back to Carmine, mm, this is yet another episode where he doesn't come off as his best self. I.e. he kind of looks like a prick. Otherwise, this episode is as close as the show will ever get to perfection when it comes to dramatic Laverne and Shirley episodes. As the ending song says, Hallelujah. The second season of Laverne and Shirley is when the show becomes iconic, giving us silly slapstick, soft sentiment, character, and relationship development. It's probably the season a lot of folks remember best from their youth, and one that's a big fave among fans to this day. If you haven't watched it yet, it's probably the best possible place for you to start your journey with the show. This is Lisa Fernandes, signing off.